Hello, friends. This is Greg Amundsen. Welcome to the Squad Room. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to episode three of the Squad Room. Very excited about today's episode. Uh, I got to travel up to Santa Cruz, California, and spend a couple hours with Greg Amundsen. Greg uh, is a name that should be familiar to anyone who does CrossFit, um, but he's pretty familiar to a lot of people outside of CrossFit who are also in law enforcement. Greg is the current owner of CrossFit Amundsen there in Santa Cruz, California, but he's one of the original members of the original gym. He started his CrossFit training back in 2001 uh, with the founder of CrossFit, Greg Glassman. Um, he eventually graduated from UC Santa Cruz and he joined the Santa Cruz uh, Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department, where he did nine years there, including some time on their SWAT team. Um, he then went to the Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, and he worked on the southwest border, and he was a DEA liaison to the Border Enforcement Security Task Force. Um, he's uh, also, not to uh, to get too tired, too lazy, he uh, then joined the Army and went through OCS, and he uh, was a captain uh, uh, in the uh, U.S. Army. Um, so great, uh, great guy, um, devoted a ton of time and was very gracious, uh, during our efforts. He is currently the law enforcement liaison for CrossFit. He is a fitness writer for Caliber Press. He does a lot of stuff for law enforcement. He spends a lot of time with law enforcement officers and he's got a lot to, a lot to offer. You can see his work, uh, and he's, he's been featured in men's health in outside magazine and police magazine. Um, he's been featured in the book Inside the Box and Learning to Breathe Fire. Uh, in fact, he was his nickname is the Original Fire Breather. Uh, and uh, if you YouTube, search YouTube for Greg Amundsen, you'll find some fascinating uh, videos, a lot of instructional videos. We're going to post a lot of those uh, on the squadroom.net um, that can um, give you a sense of who he is. Greg and uh, I had a great chat. I got to go in uh, and do a workout with him where he jumped in on the workout and hard to meet a more motivating and more genuine person out there in life. Um, he was he was very gracious um, and, and it, it turned out to be uh, a lot of fun. I got into CrossFit because of Greg and of course he didn't know it at the time, but he put out a video uh, that we'll link to on the squadroom.net. Um, about how a law enforcement officer has to treat themselves as a professional athlete. And it's a short video. Um, but as I was struggling to figure out my own routine a couple of years ago, um, that definitely clicked with me. And it wasn't, a, I wasn't a set on fire and an immediate success, but it at least got me um, thinking and it got me down that road. And it certainly led me down um this road to where I am today, where I'm trying to integrate all these other aspects into my life to optimize my life. And we talk about some of those other things. He's also an author. He wrote a relationship book that I highly recommend to anyone who uh, is in law enforcement. Um, he writes about uh, his divorce and how uh, that took him by surprise, but some of the things that he learned from it. Um, and that divorce happened while he was in law enforcement. And I, uh, I can see a lot of those same things happening in, uh, some partners lives, but also some things in my own, uh, relationship with my own wife that I, I recognized in that book and thought, okay, this, this might be able to help me make that relationship better, which is always a good thing. Um, Greg, uh, we'll talk about mentors, um, and his closer relationship with Mark Devine of, uh, seal fit and the Kokoro camps. Um, so anyway, Great guy, uh, CrossFit Amundsen.com. Amundsen is A M U N D S O N. That's how you find him uh, on the web or on uh, Instagram or Twitter, also at CrossFit Amundsen. So let's, uh, let's go visit Greg. Greg, thanks for joining me on the squad room. You're welcome. I, uh, I appreciate, let's put that a little closer to you. Um, uh, Appreciate you taking some time uh, out of your schedule to uh, to do this because I think this is uh, for me it's an important project and I think it's in line with a lot of the stuff you've done. Uh, I'm gonna have to apologize to any listeners right now because I have to geek out for a second and uh, say thank you <laughs> because uh, I've told a little bit of the story in the past on this on this show, 
but uh, you're the reason I started CrossFit. Oh, thank you. And really are the, the impetus of me uh, kind of taking this more seriously. Um, back in 2013, um, I, I was coming off a broken back injury from a mountain biking accident mm. and was uh, kind of in a cushy desk job and was kind of not taking my, my health seriously. And, I, and uh, a partner of mine turned me on to the main site. And then uh, I went down that rabbit hole. But I found your video on the importance of fitness in law enforcement, and mm. that clicked. Mm -hmm. And that uh, the importance of being a tactical athlete. Mm. And I'll ask you for your definition in a second. But for people who, uh, who don't know who you are, who aren't familiar with CrossFit necessarily, because this isn't a CrossFit podcast as much as a health and wellness and optimizing your life mm -hmm. podcast, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your uh, relationship with law enforcement? Sure. I always wanted to protect and serve. I didn't know it was necessarily law enforcement, but my nature was protecting and serving others. One of my first jobs, so to speak, when I was growing up in sixth grade, I was given the blue sash of a conflict management resolution officer. That was the hall name for people that had been identified by teachers that could help resolve and mediate problems between classmates. So I would put on my blue sash and proudly walk the playground and hallway. And <laughs> as I grew up, that ability to protect and serve and help and lead others naturally led me into a profession in law enforcement. And simultaneously, growing up, my dad was adamant about the importance of being physically fit. Physical, mental, spiritual fitness was drilled into me from a very, very young age. My earliest childhood memories of my dad and I are him driving me to the YMCA. And we were sprinting and swimming, and he had me upside down doing handstands. And so the evolution of my desire to serve was concurrent with my desire to maintain physical fitness. And as I found myself in the profession of arms and serving, what I realized is that fitness was a life-saving asset. It would not only save my life on the street, but more importantly, it would help me save the life of somebody else. And that's really where I'm teaching today, mm -hmm. is trying to remind law enforcement officers that although the technology today is much greater than it was when many of us started, the body is still the body. Mind is still the mind, and the spirit will always be the spirit. And those are the greatest assets that we have, and we have to strengthen those. Mm -hmm. And you actually, you walked the walk. I mean, you did how many years as a, as a deputy sheriff? I did nine years with the local Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office, four mm -hmm. years with the Drug Enforcement Administration, and now I serve as a reserve officer for the Santa Cruz Harbor Police. Okay. So you've, you've been there and, and done that in terms of uh, your law enforcement background, and you can relate to, you because you've done the night shifts and mm -hmm. the, the patrols and the swing shifts and all the other things, and you've, you've, you've met those challenges that I'm trying to address on this show, mm -hmm. and you've uh, been able to meet them head on. And uh, it's, it's, it's neat that you can bring that um, to other officers, too. And you're, liaison, you're the law enforcement liaison for CrossFit, Correct. Is that right, for the headquarters? Correct, yeah. So today I travel all over the country, really the world, and I teach law enforcement officers how to implement and adopt a CrossFit program for their respective department or agency or academy. Mm -hmm. And they also teach the CrossFit law enforcement seminar, which is an eight-hour seminar on how to take the law enforcement program and utilize it in a law enforcement setting, whether it be for the individual operator, a SWAT team, or a department the size of Colorado State Patrol. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm actually going to be attending one of yours uh, here in a couple of weeks. We'll, That's right. we'll see each other again Indeed. in a couple of weeks, and I'll, I'll post an update uh, yeah. with my experience from that. That's something I've been trying to accomplish at my agency for some time with some uh, uh, resistance, so I'm sure I'll have my hand up quite a bit you bet. You bet, <laughs> at that yeah. time. Um, you, so now you have CrossFit Amundsen. Mm -hmm. You just uh, I just joined you for your uh, for a workout before we recorded. That was that was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was a great experience. Um, all public safety in that class too. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. So about eighty percent of the athletes that train with me here at my gym in Santa Cruz are in the public safety sector, whether it be military, nursing, AMR, firefighting, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. It's a group of people who are protected and serving. Why do you think? Uh, CrossFit speaks so well to the, that group or, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. what, is it, what is it that draws them to that? It's a great question. You know, what we find is that most law enforcement officers or firefighters who do a CrossFit workout for the first time, most common reaction is, oh my gosh, 
it felt like I was fighting for my life. And there's that eye-opening moment where we realize the more often we can subject ourselves to that feeling, the better. Mm -hmm. It's much better to feel like you're fighting for your life in the gym and to receive that stimulus multiple times and be comfortable with it than to experience it for the first time in an actual fight on the street. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's probably a good segue to my, I, I mentioned a minute ago, your, your, your concept of the tactical athlete. Um, can you explain it a little bit more for people who may not be familiar with that term? Sure. Yeah. The, well, um, we have to give credit where credit is due. Tactical athlete, that was a term that was coined by a very dear friend of mine, Jeff Martone. Okay. And Jeff Martone also works in the law enforcement community. He teaches the CrossFit kettlebell course for our CrossFit community. Mm -hmm. Great guy, amazing coach. And he coined the term tactical athlete. And what he says is that you're ready in season and out of season. And as an operator, you're never out of season. You're always on. As yeah. a cop, we're never off duty. We are always on. In a moment's notice, we have to be able to respond. We've got to keep our blades sharp. So the way that I define this, this idea, this concept of, of being ready is an officer needs to be able to impose their physical will onto the demand of the job, whatever those demands might be. And so if you think about the civilian who is striving to be better and better in CrossFit, their intention is to increase their work capacity across broad time and modal domain. Well, that's what we're trying to do as operators. We're trying to impose our physical will onto the demand of the job, whatever those demands might be. So essentially we're doing the same thing. It just, it helps to put it in context mm -hmm. for the cop. At the end of the day, we put our hands on people. Yeah. We take bad guys to jail and our body will allow us to do that safely. I think that's a good distinction uh, because if you've ever been in the opposite position of having the physical demands of the job imposed upon you, mm -hmm. that's not a good spot to be no. in. It's not a, it's not a comfortable spot yeah. and it usually takes one of those to, mm -hmm. to never want to do that again. Yeah. This idea of having somebody impose your physical will on you or imposing your physical will on somebody else. You hear that a lot in the UFC. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll hear the commentator say, Oh, the fighter is imposing his will. You know, and I, I, I heard that <laughs> once and I'm like, man, that's, that's exactly right. Like that's what we want to do. And sometimes even our command presence, just the presence of an officer's body who's fit, that can be an imposing force. Sure. And what we find, and FBI stats will back this up, is that the more physically fit the officer, the less likely a use of force confrontation takes place. Yes, absolutely. And there's even interviews with suspects after the fact, mm -hmm. and they ask, why, why, why did you or why did you not exactly. assault the officer? And almost always the answer is he looked like he could handle himself. Yep. Or worse, I thought I could take him. Or the flip side, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. the answer you don't want to hear. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. Well, so yeah, that's why, uh, that's why I'm here. That's why I drove up and uh, trying to work through some of those processes um, of uh, uh, getting to a point where um, fitness, but not just fitness, but fitness in all its forms, mm -hmm. mental uh, health, uh, spiritual health, as yes, you mentioned, indeed. emotional health, mm -hmm. fitness, physical fitness, all of those things come together. Uh, to optimize our lives. We have a hard enough life as it is. Uh, why make it harder on ourselves with uh, poor habits or lack of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of the instigator or the motivator for, uh, for coming up here. And, and really, when I started this project, I thought, uh, you know, who, the five or six people I'd really love to interview. And I got to be honest, man, you're, you're, you were top of that list because oh, of you. all the videos. And we'll link to some of those and we'll link to you, if it's all right, to your uh, uh, articles on nutrition and Absolutely. meal prep and all that. Because I took a lot of those as my starting point mm -hmm. and got a little better, right? And um, I am by no means a professional uh, athlete in the sense of it, I, it was never ingrained in me. I was never raised with it. Mm -hmm. It was something, it's a learned behavior. I'm still learning mm -hmm. at 37, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it's good. Uh, it's, if you still need to learn new things all through your life, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd rather learn now than not learn at all. Um, so that's, we're trying to forge that path because I know that other people out there have these same questions, these same uh, concerns. I know mm -hmm. some guy out in, Idaho is driving around at 3 a.m. right now, probably listening to this going, yeah, where do I start? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll, I'll help answer that question quickly because please. where we start as cops is we embrace the idea that we are professional athletes. So a moment ago, you said, I'm not a professional athlete. You are. Yeah. If you're a law enforcement officer, you're a professional athlete. The only difference is that you're a professional warrior athlete and the sport you engage is protect and serve. The difference between our sport is that second place is not an option. 
<laughs> I like that. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I teach in the law enforcement seminar is we create this paradigm where we view ourselves as professional warrior athletes. And as soon as we do that, the game changes because then we realize if I am a professional warrior athlete, I better train like one, which leads us to CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you can go down that, uh, I guess, rabbit hole, for lack of a better term, of the kind of the, um, the stuff, the tertiary stuff on the sides of that of um, mobility, mm -hmm. right? And that's one thing I'm dealing with right now that's we're documenting is uh, just 10 years of wearing a gun belt is kind of is thrown off mm -hmm. hip flexors and pelvis, and that causes all sorts of goofy yeah. stuff, right? A lot of sitting, too. Lots of sitting. Yeah, either long in a nights car in the car, or, you, know, you bet. Or at a desk writing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, I, I like that idea that we have to think of ourselves as professional athletes. Mm -hmm. um, we just don't know when game time is, and we exactly. don't know where. Or we don't, exactly. And we don't know, most importantly, we don't know who our opponent right. is. So the demand placed upon us is greater than the demand placed upon the normally associated professional athlete. Mm -hmm. Much greater upon us. Sure. And with the, I mean, you look at a guy, uh, you had a photo of Chuck Liddell in, in the gym. Um, a guy like that has a team mm -hmm. around him. You know, he's got his trainers and all those people. I, I, I've been... Uh, more and more interested in this idea recently of building a team around mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. or me, you know, or everyone needs a team. Mm -hmm. You need a group around you. Do you, uh, do you have a team? Uh, who is on that team? Is it uh, what kind of people they are and, and how did you pick them or why are they important to being on your team? Mm -hmm. It could be anybody, but. Well, everyone needs a coach and law enforcement is inherently a team sport. Mm -hmm. You have a partner. We work as a team. And so it, I think there might be a two-part question there. It's who is on my team, and then who are my coaches? Who are my mentors? Okay. Because coaches need coaches. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so yeah. people see me, and I spend most of my time teaching and coaching and mentoring and leading. What people don't see is the work that I put into my own practice, and I actively seek out coaches and mentors and teachers and leaders to support me and my goals. Some of those people are Mark Devine. Coach Greg Glassman, the founder of CrossFit, John Hackerman, the founder of the Pit Fight Team. So I seek out these mentors and I go to them humbly as a student. And through my efforts as a student, I am then able to teach others. We uh, we did an episode, and I don't know where it's going to fall in here, uh, but with my coach on mm -hmm. the importance of having a coach, and mm -hmm. he's got a coach, mm -hmm. and I keep that keeps coming up uh, as an important concept. Right? Mm -hmm. There's no there's no one person who knows it all. Right. And everybody needs. I, I totally agree with you. Everyone needs a coach or a team. I was going to ask, um, yeah, you've spoken about your relationship with Mark Devine before. Mm -hmm. um, amazing guy. Mm -hmm. I've spoken on this podcast before about uh, him and his podcast and his Unbeatable Mind program. But um, how do you recommend people go about finding uh, mentors? Maybe not at that level, but even within their own agency or uh, at their local box or their gym or, you know. Mm -hmm. any, any tips for, uh, for kind of seeking those people out or what they should be looking for? The, there's, there's a law of attraction that takes place in these cases where the person who you need in your life to lead you, you will attract that person based on the direction you're going in your life. Now, sadly, it works two ways. People who are going down the wrong direction are going to attract into their life leaders who are leading them the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And people that are going the right direction are going to attract into their life people who will lead them the right way. And so there's, there's this moment where the... I think I just finished reading this book called Autobiography of a Yogi. And, and in the book, it says that the student will attract the guru and the guru is simultaneously seeking the student. Okay. And so I think the key for somebody who, who is in that moment of needing direction and needing leadership and needing a coach, they need to first ask themselves, where do I want to go? What do I want to do? And if it's athleticism, it's a profession. In that moment of deciding where they want to go, they will start to attract the right mentor who will get them where they want to go. Mm -hmm. Um other members of your team, do you have uh, people that come and come up, commonly come up, um, and people I've recently sort of brought on is 
a coach, mm -hmm. personal coach who's, who's guiding me through nutrition and physical stuff and all that and, and adding a lot of other aspects to it. But, uh, finally finding a, a good sports medicine minded physical therapist was one of mine. Mm -hmm. Any, any others that you might have that you kind of see on a regular basis? It could be even a, 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 a a uh, pastor or uh, yeah. something like that? or Well, I mean, the, you know, a, a mentor doesn't need to necessarily be living. And so Jesus <laughs> okay. is one of my mentors. Sure. Because I seek out his wisdom and his counsel daily. I have an acupuncturist I've been seeing for 14 years. Even when I was living in Southern California, I would fly home to see her on a regular basis. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so I'm very loyal to the people who I turn to as someone who I respect. Coach Glassman, for example, has been my coach mm -hmm. for nearly 15 years. Yeah. John Halcombe, nearly 13 years. Mark Devine, nearly 10. So you find these mentors in your life and then you, you cling to them. Yeah. And you stay as close to them as possible because they lead you the way that you ultimately want to go. Right. And so the first thing I would really recommend to somebody is have a definite direction you want to go in life. If your goal is to be a law enforcement officer, then seek out somebody who is successful as a law enforcement officer and draw close to that person. Even if you don't know the questions to ask, just watch them. And here's the key about someone who's a mentor, a mentor or a leader, the most effective way to lead is by example. And so all you really have to do is literally follow somebody who is an effective leader and they will get you where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Look at Mark Devine. Mark leads, physically leads a lot of the 20X and seal foot programs that he teaches. Wow. What yeah. a leader. Someone who says, follow me. I will show you how to do it. I will lead the way. And then people follow and people are successful as a result of that. Sure. That's like Chuck Liddell and John Hackleman. John would get in the cage and spar and move and train and grapple with Chuck and look at the success that Chuck had. That's a great coach. Yeah. Excellent. So that's what we want to seek out. We want to seek out those leaders and those mentors who are able to, to, to literally and physically lead, lead and show front. us and lead from the front. Great. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about um, was something I, I just caught on to this recently, um, and there's a couple different names for it. Um, but you could call it decision fatigue or uh, kind of your cognitive bank, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and jumping ahead a little bit, but you wrote about it a little bit in your book um, in the sense that, you know, you, you, we, we make these decisions every day at work, mm -hmm. Hun sometimes hundreds of decisions, sometimes minute, sometimes very stressful, sometimes monumentous decisions, mm -hmm. decisions that affect our lives or other people's lives. And when we get off work and we're just taxed, mm -hmm. We don't have that space in our, in our head to make any more decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my first question was, do you, when you uh, were working full time or do you now have any morning routines or nighttime routines that might help you get centered, but also maybe minimize some of the decision fatigue you have to do every mm -hmm. day? If that makes sense. Absolutely. Great, great term. The decision fatigue, everything we do requires willpower and willpower is a muscle that can become fatigued. We use our willpower daily in CrossFit, immense willpower. One more repetition is just as much mental, emotional, spiritual willpower as it is physical exhaustion. Now the willpower is cumulative and the body can't differentiate between the willpower it takes to do one more pull up and the willpower it takes as a cop not to lewdly respond to a citizen's request. Willpower is willpower, mm -hmm. and it can be exhausted, just like anything else, just like any other physical part of the body. We understand muscle exhaustion. What we don't yet understand is the, the exhaustion of our willpower and how that affects our emotional choices. Thus, a morning practice, and this is something that Mark Devine and I are both adamant about. There was a book written years ago, and I highly recommend everyone listening read this book. It's called... Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And what Viktor teaches, I think, is rather life-changing. It's profound. And what he teaches is that between every stimulus and our response to this stimulus is space. The way that we access the space is through a breath. Our morning practice allows us to expand 
that space. The Bible talks about this frequently, this idea of being still and know that I am God. That's one of the commands of the Bible. Be still. Stop moving around so much. I can handle this, right? And in that stillness is profound strength. Yet so often we think that stillness and silence and non-responsiveness is weakness. Think about the officer on the street. We're trained to have immediate response to stimulus. Mm -hmm. In some cases, that can be life-saving. On the street, the sooner we pick up on the preemptive cues of a violent offender, the better. On the street, in that one particular context. Sure. Yet nearly everywhere else in our life, we can benefit and value taking space taking a breath. And then in that space, we realize, oh my goodness, I'm faced with an infinite number of responses. They don't have to be preconditioned. I don't have to live my life on a habitual nature. I can make independent choices based on the moment. Mm -hmm. I have control. I can direct the influence of my life. And so how do you, how do you do that in your morning practice? Do you do meditation? Or meditation. 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 What I do and what I teach people is meditating in a pose in yoga known as child's pose. Mm -hmm. Seated meditation is great. If you watch someone try to sit and meditate, you'll notice that they're going to fidget. Their body's going to move. Mm -hmm. The movement of the body is creating movement in the mind and vice versa. There's something extremely grounding about child's pose. And if people who are listening are unfamiliar with child's pose, you could simply Google it. I'll put a photo up on, or put a uh, photo up. on, my, on the show notes so awesome. you can see it. So when you, when you look at this photo, what you'll notice is that in, in an effective child's pose, there's a lot of our body touching the ground, a lot of surface area. We yeah. become very physically still. It's a very, very strong position, a very stable position. Mm -hmm. So I'll meditate in that position for the stillness that allows my body. And in the stillness of my body, I achieve stillness in my mind. And I'll literally just breathe and I'll just be still. And this great imagery, this great metaphor that my yoga teacher, Rolf Gates, gave me, he says, just sit still and allow the sand to settle and the water to become clear. So imagine this. Imagine that you have a plastic bottle full of water and you put sand into the bottle and you shake up the bottle. The sand will evenly spread throughout the entire bottle. And if you want the sand to settle, it's not a matter of continuing to shake it. It's so easy. All you do is put the bottle down. And in a moment, the sand will settle mm -hmm. once the bottle is physically still. And it's the same thing with the body. When we can physically become still, the mind will become still. We reach a level of peace. And how long do you go for a day? Or you know, so much of my practice outside of yoga and meditation is under some type of quantification. I'm quantifying it just like our workout today. Mm -hmm. How long did we go? How many reps? Everything's recorded. When it comes to my yoga practice and meditation, I don't quantify it. Oh, okay. I just, I just find stillness and I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm there for, for a few minutes. Maybe I'm there for, I don't think it's a few hours, but maybe there's longer periods that I become still for. I, I don't know. I just, I just drop in to the stillness and I just try to touch, touch God. And I just try to communicate with God. And sometimes that's a brief communication. Sometimes it could be very, very long. My, uh, my coach Traver, uh, he's given me meditation as one of my to do's. Yeah. So I've been working on it and yeah, sitting has been one of the hardest parts. Like mm -hmm. I get fidgety or I can't get still, yeah. my, you know, back tightens up or whatever. So I'll, I'll have to try the child's. Yeah, I think pose. you'll be I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. There's also a nice physical element to that. Mm -hmm. Where physically that's a nice pose to be in. It's comfortable. It's comfortable. It can really provide some opening for the low back and hips. Yeah. It's a good pose. He also calls it dropping in, so you both are obviously surfers. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, dropping in I I'm not a very good surfer. I just there's that idea of like just dropping that's the into best something. That's the best way to explain. Yeah. Kind you of know what, what you happens. mean when you say that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um you know, uh, one thing that always uh, impresses me about cops um, is just our, our ability or th their ability. Um, I say our just because I'm fortunate to count myself as one of them. Mm -hmm. um, is our ability to uh, 
devote ourselves to the mission of both the department and to the mission of serving other people. Mm -hmm. And we do that every day. And we do that for long hours and um, not a lot of uh, positive attention at times. Um, but they still do it every day. And that's one thing that just makes me love coming to work is I get to work with people who just go out and do it. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but I, I wonder if you have any insights on why we might sometimes struggle to provide ourselves that same dedication of, to giving ourselves that same attention, um, if that makes any sense. And why uh, we can devote all this time and energy and focus to helping others, but we may not be so uh, dedicated to ourselves, mm -hmm. if that were. Mm -hmm. Well, the encouragement I would give to someone who was under that realization is by strengthening ourself, by having a practice that supports ourself, we're better able to support other people. I talk about this in my book, where if you really want to learn how to love somebody else, if you want to be able to give love, you have to have love. You have to have a level of self-love. If you really want to be effective at helping other people, you've got to be able to help yourself. The strongest person is someone who is so capable of helping themselves. They're so effective of themselves, they can then effectively help others i like that and you bring up your book uh so it's a good time to talk about it um it's called your wife is not your sister mm -hmm. and uh a year or two old now more than that even maybe maybe even getting closer to three years okay. now um can you tell us a little bit about what caused you to write that book and some of the uh maybe some of the we'll get into some of the lessons that i took from it but also what i think could apply specifically to 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 police. Sure. Sure. You know, the, the book wrote itself. I went, went through a divorce that kind of caught me by surprise. And I had the good fortune to be able to kind of remove myself from society for two months. I had a plot of land in Aptos, which is Southern Santa Cruz County. I had a Airstream and I lived in this Airstream almost in seclusion in silence for, for nearly two months. And during that time, the Lord just worked through me and he just helped heal my heart. And one of the things that was put on my heart was write down the lessons that you learned. And so you won't make them again. Mm -hmm. Just identify what went wrong. What happened? What did you learn? And I started to do that. And one day I, I mean, I'm looking at 50 or 60 pages of written word. I'm like, my goodness, where did this come from? Half, half of the book, I don't even remember writing. It just wrote itself. And then I, I thought, man, you know what? If, if I made these mistakes, I, I better make sure that my brothers aren't making the same mistakes. So I sent a copy to my brothers, Mark, Stephen, and Eric, and they sent an email back saying, my goodness, we are making some of these mistakes in our relationships. Then I thought, whoa, that's not good. If my, if my own brothers are making these mistakes, I better make sure some of my very good friends who are also cops mm -hmm. aren't making these mistakes. I sent a copy to Jeff Martone, who I already mentioned, George Ryan, LAPD SWAT. Yeah. They sent an email back. Holy moly, we're making some of these mistakes. And then I thought, okay, I'm onto something here. If, if all these people are potentially making some of these mistakes that I made, let me get the word out there. Let me help people and so that they can avoid these pitfalls in relationship before they even happen. Okay. And the book, therefore, kind of yeah. wrote itself. I never planned on writing it. Yeah. It just kind of happened. Um. I like, uh, I like how in the book you do each chapter has action steps. Yes. Together, right. And, um, again, we'll, we'll post a link to it for anyone who I highly recommend it as a, uh, good relationship guideline, uh, specifically for cops. Because exactly. we, I read that, uh, two things, uh, which are two ways. One thinking he's definitely a cop <laughs> <laughs> and this was going on yeah. and yeah, they're just quintessential cop problems. Right. And just like your friends reading it going, oh, yeah, we should probably stop doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, if anyone's wondering what we're talking about, uh, anytime we talked about decision fatigue earlier and coming home and being irritated, use the example in the book of uh, dinner not being ready and mm -hmm. being frustrated that, uh, that dinner's not ready to go, right? And <clears throat> I thought instantly my, my constant with that is, uh, you know, what should we have for dinner tonight? And those texts come in while you're at work and like, mm -hmm. I don't care. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
just, just don't make me pick. Right. right. I'll eat anything. Just don't make me pick. Yeah. And realizing that that is probably more of uh, a symptom of like that decision fatigue than it is any sort of real conflict with my wife, but that mm-hmm. causes a conflict that is then very real. Mm-hmm. Uh, that one definitely stuck out mm-hmm. to me. Um, or uh, I know every every cop's gotten the uh, you know don't treat me like one of your suspects. Right. Don't don't interrogate me. Right. Or your children. Yes. Don't interrogate our daughter like uh, like she's you know one of your one of your suspects. Um, it's those are it's good reminders. Mm-hmm. I highly recommend. It's a it's a very good read. It's an easy read. Mm-hmm. So, um, thank you for writing that too. I'm, I'm sure I know it's helped. I'm sure it's helped a lot of people. The, but. the feedback has been overwhelming. It's been. I'm very grateful for for the success of the book and for the number of people that it has helped. Good. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, you teach a course on goal setting, mm-hmm. and uh, I think. I've talked on this podcast in episode uh, two, I think, on on getting my own goals set forth with my coach and kind of laying those out. Um, but can you walk us through briefly? Because goal setting could be it's a, a, a six part mini series mm-hmm. on its own. Mm-hmm. But um, maybe how you recommend people set goals? Mm-hmm. Um, are there is there a specific way that you think that law enforcement should set goals or? What's the process that someone should go through when they're saying, okay, here's my A point, uh, or here's where I think my A point is, and I want to get to B. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how do I get there? Mm-hmm. The first thing we do is define the word goal. We have to define our terms. If I were to say, listener, I want you to do 10 air squats. That's a CrossFit listener. They are going to know what the air squat is. Even if they did not do the air squat, they can, in their mind, visualize the air squat. We know what we're talking about. We're on the same page. However, if I said, I want you to set a goal, that's a vague term. Mm -hmm. And so what I did years ago was I simply defined that term for the benefit of the CrossFit community. A goal is a specifically desired end state expressed in the positive tense that provides motivation and direction on the path to achievement. So let's break that down specifically desired end state. So when I grow up, I want to be a fire engine. I mean, we hear these kids at a young age talking about their aspirations and their goals. Well, as adults, as we move into adulthood and when we really want something, we have to define exactly what it is we want in terms of CrossFit. These are always easy examples to use. It's one thing to say, I want to do 20 pull-ups. However, if I'm working with an individual athlete, I would pose the question, what type of pull-up? And right away, wow, we realize, well, is that a gymnastic pull-up? Is it a kipping pull-up? If it is a kipping pull-up, is that a butterfly, frog kip, traditional gymnastic kip, strict, L-sit? Wow, weighted, what kind of pull-up is that? Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, even with a seemingly simple goal like 10 pull-ups, we realize that we can still become very, very specific with it. So for example, we have start point A, I want to do 10 pull-ups. We refine the goal, we come back with B, I want to do 10 consecutive fluid gymnastic kipping pull-ups. That's the goal. Because I use some keywords, consecutive, fluid, gymnastic kipping. So I'm being very specific, I'm programming for my mind and therefore my body exactly what it is I want to achieve. Now let's talk about some common faults, right? So we have common faults in our physical skills. One of the most common faults in goal setting is use of the negative tense. For example, I want to do 10 unbroken gymnastic kipping pull-ups. Cue on the word unbroken as opposed to consecutive. If we really listen, now cops out there, we should be experts in listening. We're trained observers. We should be able to listen and look and see things for what they are. So if we really listen to other people, and sadly, even ourselves, what we realize is that we live in a culture that communicates in the negative tense. People are always complaining, and they're wondering why they continue to attract into their life what they're complaining about. However, When you surround yourself with successful people, they are talking about success. They're talking about health, about strength, about wellness. 
and what are they attracting into their life? What they're talking about. Right. And so the key with goal setting is to maintain a positive mental attitude. And this goes back to the Bible. This is exactly how Jesus taught us to pray. We pray the solution. We talk the solution and we attract the solution into our life. It happens by law. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think uh, there's another common way of, of thinking about it too in that you, uh, you can't become something without first thinking it and then acting on it mm -hmm. and then you become it. Mm -hmm. I can't, uh, I can't say I am a good person, but then I, but not think it and not act it mm -hmm. to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, totally off topic, but it just, it strikes mm -hmm. me the same, uh, uh, that, that that's the same, that's the same pattern is, um, if you want a goal, you need to think it and then act upon it mm -hmm. and then you'll become it. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add is, is the emotion. Mm -hmm. So you think it, you feel it, you become it. We attract into our life, not so much what we say and what we think, but what we feel. And so we can use our thoughts and our words to create an emotion, a feeling, which many scholars refer to as a vibration or a calibration. And through that vibration, we attract what is vibrating at the same frequency which is also known as a law of attraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A related concept that I've been hearing a lot recently is you are the average of the five people that are mm -hmm. closest to you. Mm -hmm. That seems to be coming up a lot mm -hmm. recently. I don't know that's why it's popular, but yes, same sort of thing. Yes. And if you change that group, your average goes up or goes down. Correct. And I think any one of us who's uh, ever gone into a stranger's house can see uh, the positive and negatives of that. You mm -hmm. know, when you're, when you're dealing with the public, mm-hmm. Uh, we mentioned you teach the CrossFit, a bunch of different courses around the country, around the world, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and you see these different uh, departments' approaches to CrossFit or mm -hmm. to just health and wellness in general. Um, what do you think are some of the uh, um, roadblocks or, or problems in getting wellness taken seriously uh, at police agencies? Well... Let me answer that in the positive tense. All right. And, and we'll talk solutions. So what have I seen strategically work in law enforcement departments to implement a physical fitness program? What I've seen is leadership by example. One of the best examples of this is a good friend of mine named Steve Logan. Steve works for LASD, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. He's on their SEB, their Special Enforcement Bureau team. Legit. That team yes. is the real deal. Yes, and Steve are. Logan is the real deal. As real deal as that team is, their culture was still bodybuilding, long, slow distance running and standing in front of a mirror, bicep curling. And granted, these guys had nice looking biceps. Their functional fitness was lacking. Steve realized that. So rather than being inside the comfortable gym in front of the mirror, Steve would take the dumbbells outside and he would do things like thruster. He would do dumbbell snatches. There was a park bench that he would jump onto as his box jump. Now, it turns out inside this gym where the other guys were doing bicep curls, there was a big window. And these guys could look out the window and they were watching Steve get after it. And Steve was doing CrossFit. Well, what do you think happened a few weeks later? One brave soul is like, hey, Steve, what's that thruster thing you're doing? <laughs> Steve says, well, come outside and I'll teach you. Now you've got two. A few weeks later, another guy comes out. Now you've got three. Soon you had six, then tw next thing you know, the whole team is outside doing these CrossFit workouts. At that point, they had a good case to make. And they said, hey, how about we affiliate with CrossFit and build a CrossFit gym? Which leads us to an amazing video I recommend everyone watch. You could link to it. It's called Opening Day at SEB CrossFit. Yep, yep. And it shows these guys getting after it. And it's a beautiful gym. And what's amazing about this is during that video, as we were filming, one of the teens, one of the platoons had a call out. So we're about 10 minutes into some gnarly workout. Tone goes off. Half the guys leave the gym, throw on their kit, jump in the Humvee, and whoosh, away <laughs> they go to a call. And I'm like, man, this is the real deal. Yeah. Now it's the real deal. It wasn't the real deal before. Now it's the real deal. Yeah. So my recommendation to an individual operator, an officer listening, is if you believe in physical fitness, 
then set an example for your peers to follow. We can individually change the world. If we really believe in ourselves, if we really lead by example, we can single-handedly change our department. I like that. Uh, you have another great video with Santa Monica PD. Mm-hmm. And actually, uh, you know, Scott McGee. I love that guy. He's agreed to come on the show at oh, some point. Oh, great. So he's a great man. Yeah. yeah, he's helped me uh, with some other stuff, uh, trying to get some resources for my department. And mm-hmm. uh, so I look forward to talking to him, too. They, they take it very seriously, yes. too. So cool story. This is, I wonder by the time this airs, if this will have happened. Right now, I'm talking about in the future. Mm-hmm. I just got back from Florida. I was working with St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office. They are currently the only SWAT team in the country that runs MRF as their SWAT test. Santa Monica SWAT was the first team in the country to adopt that. They no longer run that test. Oh. However, based on the fact that St. Lucie SWAT is running that test, I called Scott McGee and I said, Scott, how about we have a cross country throwdown? So we're looking at June as the month this will kick off. St. Lucie can pick their top 10 guys. Santa Monica can pick their top 10 guys. Both of these teams, their top 10 do MRF. And then the times are added up, lowest overall team time wins, oh. bragging rights, cost country. And what we hope is that by these two teams doing it, other teams will want to participate. And ideas like that, as simple as it seems, hey, a cross country Murph throwdown, for the guys listening out there, those are the ideas and the challenges and the energies that can really, really create positive momentum in the department. Murph's kind of taken on a mythical yeah, uh, idea outside of CrossFit, even people sure. know what Murph is. But explain what Murph, Murph is for people who don't know what the workout is for people who haven't actually heard of it. Sure, in CrossFit, CrossFit has really since the inception devoted itself to the public safety, to the warrior, to the military operator. One of the ways they've done that is by creating what's called hero workouts. And one of the greatest hero workouts ever created was for Lieutenant Michael Murphy. And that's a hero workout that is just gnarly. It's a one mile run followed by 100 pull ups, 200 push ups, 300 squats, and then you run one more mile. And oh, by the way, if you have a 20 pound weight vest, just go ahead and wear it. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. That's Murph. Yeah. Someday. Yeah. It's on my, uh, it's on my bucket list, but it's not, I'm not there yet. That is a workout. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I heard this question on a totally unrelated podcast, but I thought it was a good question to ask. And, and you're, um, I think you're a good guy to ask it of, and we'll, we'll wrap up soon. Um, if you, if this was your last day hmm. and you were, uh, you were on your way out and you knew this was your last day on earth, what were, what would be, uh, three truths that you would want to pass on to your friends, uh, to people who call you coach, hmm. Any, any advice or any, any, anything that you've, you've found that is a, a truth for you? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. Back to my yoga teacher, Rolf Gates, what he teaches is the key to a happy life is the alignment of your values and actions. And so it's a matter of deciding what you hold dear. What are our truths? What do we align with? and then acting on those truths. One of the truths I align with is the concept of a positive mental attitude, maintaining a positive vibration, seeing things on the positive side, being a force multiplier through your optimism. So I hold true to choosing positivity to choosing love, to choosing kindness, to choosing courage, to choosing strength. Those are choices that we can make. And those all fall under the umbrella of positivity, of choosing to be positive, aligning with positivity. So that would be one, doing my best to remain positive. Number two would likely have to be justice, doing what's right. That would almost define my life. Yeah. Choosing to do what's right. We know 
in our soul what's right and wrong. And having a practice, being able to create space, allows us to access in the moment what's right. Many scholars refer to this as spontaneous right action. Always knowing what's right. Karma is a very real thing. Jesus talks about this. Reap what you sow. Planting seeds. If a farmer plants an apple seed, he knows an apple tree will grow. He doesn't plant an apple seed and expect corn to grow. (laughs) Yet sometimes we are shocked by the results of our life. We can't understand them. We have to learn how to unravel the mystery of cause and effect. With a practice, we can know in the moment what's right, and that's justice. So doing the right thing leads to right results. So number one would be positivity. Number two would be justice. Number three would have to be courage. Be courage. Have courage. Courage comes from the Latin root cur, C-U-R, which means open-hearted. And so this idea of going through life with an open heart and open-heartedness allows you to have a great deal of love for other people because you have an open heart. You're courageous. You can be courageous for other people. You can have an open heart. You can love. You can forgive in the moment. You can have the courage to do what's right. You can have the courage to maintain a positive mental attitude despite what your surroundings look like. Courage might be the most important then because it allows you to act on the other two. Sure. I, yeah, absolutely. So there you have it. Positive <clears throat> mental attitude, justice, do what's right, have courage, have an open heart. It takes a lot of courage to do both of the first two sometimes. <laughs> you bet it does. Yeah, yeah. that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, if you have a couple seconds, I have a couple questions from people who I, I told a couple people. I'm, I, cool. I got the opportunity to come up and talk to you, and they said, oh, Ask them this. Cool. Thank so you. Here's That's... a couple quick ones. It is, they're simple. Sure. Um, if you had only 15 minutes a day to focus on your fitness, however you define that, mm-hmm. what would you be doing? 15 minutes a day for exercise? Could be, yeah. I mean, they, I think they meant it as exercise, but more accurately, is there, you know, is there something I'm not thinking of, they're not thinking of, that would actually be more of a force multiplier that may not necessarily be physical, but... If you had 15 minutes to focus on your, yeah, say your physical, physical fitness each day. What I would do with those 15 minutes is I would use a calculator to equally divide them first into thirds. It would be equal part nutrition, equal part physical activity, equal part stillness slash meditation. So really, yeah, you just said it, but those are equally important to you. Equally important. Uh, And so it it would be a grave mistake to think, oh, I only have 15 minutes a day. I'm going to only work out. I'm going to only do the physical. Well, we have to support the effort physically with nutrition. And then we have to tap into the spirit. We have to tap into the source that ties everything together. And that can be accessed through meditation, through prayer. Excellent. Uh, Another one was um, if you had to give one CrossFit workout that was an ideal for law enforcement, what would that be? Wow, that's an awesome question. I've always had a great deal of affection for the workout Helen. Helen, for many years, was simply known as the CrossFit Challenge. Before the CrossFit Games, a group of people from headquarters under the direction of Coach Glassman would travel around the country, and we would have the CrossFit Challenge throwdown, which was just Helen Mm -hmm. and Helen for our listeners that may not know is three rounds run 400 meters, 21 kettlebell swings, 12 pull-ups to this day. It's one of my favorite. I've done that hundreds of times. I love that workout. We did a version of that workout at the very first CrossFit law enforcement summit. The only difference is that we ran with the kettlebell. (laughs) So 400 meter run with a kettlebell and then the swing and then the pull-up. Just a great workout. Mm -hmm. Just a great workout. Fantastic. But what I'd recommend to officers is do CrossFit. CrossFit, the formula, constantly varied functional movement, high intensity. That's what cops need to be doing. Yeah. That's life-saving fitness right there. 
Oh, I agree. I, I, I've seen it. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question was, what is, what does your nutrition look like? Uh, you wrote an article quite some time ago, but it was a long time ago I, that I think you were doing zone. Correct. Uh, are you still doing that or, or how do you function? I'm a simple man, function? brother. <laughs> yeah, man. I've been doing the zone. I started the zone diet about two months after I started CrossFit. Coach Glassman recommended the zone diet to me and I started doing it and I do it to this day. The article I wrote you're referring to is diet secrets of the Tupperware man. And sadly, I still use Tupperware. <laughs> I live just down the street. I could just walk home every day and make meals. I just still pack them, put them in Tupperware, bring them to the gym. I recommend to officers listening out there, you want equal part quality and quantity. Those two things can be great friends. Mm -hmm. And so we should be eating healthy food and that food should be proportioned correctly. I think too, it's uh, jumping way back to that conversation we had about decision fatigue. If you eat the same things or you, you prep your meals and you plan, it's one less thing you have to worry about and you have to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes your day a little easier too, yes. I imagine, right? Yes. You've been eating it now for what, 15 years? I think years? coming on 15 years. Yeah. So you've got it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's probably one of those things you just don't have to, it's, it's just ingrained in you at this point. Yes. Very cool. Yeah. Man, I appreciate you taking the time. Hey, my it's pleasure. A real, real gift for me to be able to be Thank up Thank you, here. brother. I feel blessed having you here. Thank oh, you. No, I appreciate the invite to come up. A lot of fun getting the work out in the box. And uh, again, thank you for your time. Indeed. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.